Welcome to part one of the overview of concurrent and network software layers. In this part of the module, we'll start out by motivating the need for a layered architecture to use for concurrent and network software. We'll then describe some of the key concurrent and network software layers with an emphasis on middleware. In the intro to this section, I mentioned that we wouldn't cover a whole lot of patterns in this part of the course. But I do want to start with one pattern just to kick things off, because it'll help to provide the context and structure for most of the discussions in this module. Here's the context. Imagine that you're developing concurrent and network software, and you've got lots of components and lots of developers. One thing you have to be very careful of in such a context is the complexity that stems from the needed capabilities that are provided at many different levels of abstraction. It's often hard to keep track of all the components and all their dependencies if everything exists in one monolithic structure. What's the solution? Apply the layers pattern to create a multi-tier architecture or a multi-layer architecture that separates concerns between tasks in different system layers. The layers pattern structures software applications and infrastructure by decomposing them into groups of subtasks where each group resides at a particular level of abstraction. This pattern is described in the Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture Volume 1 book, so-called POSA 1. And you can also find an overview of the pattern at the URL on this slide. So with that as background, let's talk about some of the common layers of concurrent and network software. If you go back 50 years ago or so, people had a tendency in those days to develop software applications directly atop the hardware. The abstraction simply hadn't developed and matured at that point. If you went back about 40 years ago, you'd find that most people were building software applications on top of operating systems and protocol stacks, things like early versions of, of Unix, VMS, and so on. While this was certainly a step forward relative to trying to build on top of the hardware directly, it still tends to be tedious and error prone and costly across the life cycle because you have to wrestle with lots of inherent and accidental complexities that lurk in those low-level ways of developing software. If you go back 20 years ago or so, people began to develop applications on top of something called middleware. Middleware, in this context, is essentially reusable infrastructure software that resides underneath the applications and on top of the underlying operating systems, protocols, hardware, processors, networks, and so on. Its purpose is to basically shield the applications from a lot of the accidental and inherent complexities of the lower level mechanisms. As with network protocols, there are layers of middleware. And we're going to talk about some of those layers in just a moment. You can take a look at this paper for more of an overview of the background and some of the key concepts involved with middleware. Standards-based middleware that is packaged in commercial off-the-shelf solutions helps to do a number of important things for concurrent and network software. One thing it does is it helps to leverage advances in hardware and software without breaking the applications. You can have new processors. You can have new network protocols. You can have new programming languages that come along. And the software at the higher layers is often unaffected by the enhancements and advances at the lower layers. A related concept is that it makes it easier to be able to evolve your applications to handle new requirements and new environments. You may have to run on a new operating system, and middleware can help shield you from some of those dependencies. You may have new requirements for fault tolerance or security or various kinds of real-time behavior. And once again, the middleware can, can abstract away and handle a lot of those concerns. In general, middleware provides an array of off-the-shelf developer-oriented services, things that handle naming and events and reliability, load balancing, security, dynamic resource management, and so on. And another important property that middleware provides is control over end-to-end -end resources and quality of service. For example, the middleware may be responsible for allocating replicas and keeping track of them, making sure that they're running, ensuring that state is transferred correctly back and forth between active and passive replicas, being able to handle uh, various resource allocation tasks that occur in a distributed system, look up information, keep track of liveness, and so on. These are all things that used to have to be done by the application developers, but now can be offloaded to the middleware itself. 
What we're going to do in the rest of this part of the module is just quickly go through the different layers involved in classic concurrent and network software so you get a better understanding of what's going on under the hood as well as the particular layers we're going to focus on in this course. The lowest layer that we're interested in here is the layer of, of operating systems and protocols. If you think about an operating system, it's essentially a hardware abstraction layer. Its purpose is to shield applications and higher level services from the various low level complexities and diversity of the hardware. An operating system typically does a number of things. It supports scheduling of, of threads over top of CPUs. It manages virtual memory. It provides various forms of storage, persistence, file systems, and so on. And perhaps importantly for our particular topics, it supports a whole range of local and remote inter-process communication mechanisms. There's a wide variety of different operating systems and protocols available out there. You have Unix and Linux. You have Windows, VxWorks, Lynx OS, and so on. And of course, there's also many, many protocols, TCP IP, UDP, HTTP, and the like. And these protocols and operating systems really provide the underlying infrastructure, something like the interstate road system that other things rely on to carry out their work. Well, if an operating system is a hardware abstraction layer, host infrastructure middleware is an operating system abstraction layer abstraction layer. It abstracts away from the diversity in the underlying operating systems. Like it or not, despite lots of attempts at trying to standardize and codify operating systems, there are a wide variety of different versions of Linux and Unix, different versions of Windows, many, many different real-time and embedded systems. And even if there was just one, the programming interfaces for most of those operating systems tend to be written in low-level languages like C, which are full of accidental complexities. So host infrastructure middleware encapsulates and enhances native operating system mechanisms to create reusable object-oriented components that abstract away from many of the tedious and error-prone aspects of these low-level system interfaces. There's a wide range of host infrastructure middleware, much of which you are probably familiar with. Uh, the Java virtual machine, real-time Java, the common language runtime from Microsoft. Those are some examples of host infrastructure middleware that abstract away from the details of the operating system. For many years, the past 20 years or so, my research group and colleagues have been developing the Adaptive Communication Environment, or ACE, which is an open source framework that provides a variety of different services for at the host infrastructure middleware layer to make it easier to build object-oriented concurrent and networked applications. This particular layer is now fairly well established. There's not a lot of controversy widely used. Many people use virtual machines. Many people use ACE. And it helps to abstract away from certain complexities that otherwise make your life more complicated as a developer of concurrent and networked applications. But host infrastructure middleware by itself doesn't really go far enough. As you start trying to build network systems, as you start to build systems that have to work in a distributed environment, having an abstraction of the operating system is helpful. It's necessary, perhaps, but it's by no means sufficient. So one of the next important layers is the concept of distribution middleware which essentially provides you with more of an object or component or service-oriented interface that abstracts away the fact that there's a network connecting various parts of your solution. Essentially, distribution middleware simplifies network component and object programming and extends the operating system mechanisms end-to-end -to, -end to go across the network. There's a number of examples of distribution middleware that are widely used. I've worked for many years with Corba, more recently with DDS, which is the uh, another OMG standard that provides support for distributed data dissemination in uh, network systems. Other examples would be things like the Simple Object Application Protocol, or SOAP, various forms of web services, RPC, SUNS Remote Method Invocation, and going back in time, things like Microsoft DCOM. These allow you to be able to invoke operations on what appear to be objects and the underlying distribution middleware works in conjunction with other parts of the software in order to be able to communicate across address spaces, which may, in fact, be on different machines. Some of the other nice things that distribution middleware does is it avoids having to hard code your client and server applications to have deep dependencies on object location, programming language, operating system, network protocol, and hardware. 
It abstracts those things away. These types of technologies for distribution middleware are fairly widely used these days, especially in the enterprise space. There are still some domains, particularly real-time embedded systems, where people are a little bit nervous about the overheads of distribution middleware. But by and large, if you spend the right time, do the trade study analysis, do benchmarking and profiling, you'll find that distribution middleware adds relatively little overhead to the applications that you're trying to write in these environments. The next layer up is one that has to leverage the infrastructure that we've just talked about. This is the layer of common middleware services. Once you've got distribution middleware and the ability to be able to invoke operations on potentially remote objects, it makes sense to start to build a whole array of reusable services that take advantage of those underlying capabilities. These services are generally meant to be fairly domain independent. They include things like distributed naming, distributed events and notification, distributed security, distributed fault tolerance, and other types of things you might have for multimedia access and various kinds of transaction support. This particular layer is not quite as well established from a standards point of view, although you will find examples with the Java Enterprise Edition, Microsoft.net, various W3C web services, and of course, many Corba object services that have been around for quite some time. These are some of the examples of common middleware services. Not as widely adopted in many domains as we might want, but are still available to, to be understood and applied when they work for you. The last layer we'll talk about here is the layer of domain-specific middleware services. These are the kind of services you're not likely to get off the shelf because they tend to represent the intellectual property and perhaps even in some cases the trade secrets of companies that develop applications and hardware and services in a particular domain, perhaps the domain of automation or aerospace or avionics or healthcare or e-commerce. We're going to talk about a couple of examples of domain-specific middleware in this course, one of which will be avionics control systems. And we'll also talk a bit about electronic medical information systems and medical imaging systems, which are good examples of well-established, mature, domain-specific middleware services that are being provided by a number of different companies in this space. So let's go back and, and kind of think about how these layers relate back to the pattern we discussed before, the, the layers pattern. This pattern has a number of pros and cons as evidence from what we just discussed. Some of the benefits you get with layers is reuse. So if you have a layer that, like an operating system layer or a host infrastructure middleware layer, once you've got that layer well-established, codified, perhaps even standardized, you can start to use that and be confident it's going to work for you for what you're trying to do in your application space. One of the reasons that you can be assured of this is because with standards become markets where people compete to provide you better implementations, better performance, better price, better functionality, and so on, while preserving and future-proofing the investment you make in the applications you build today. The middleware layers and operating system layers we've talked about are a wealth of standards. There's the OMG standards, there's the Open Group standards, the OASIS and W3C standards, there's IEEE, there's IETF for the networking, things like Java can be considered standards as well because they're widely used and, and well codified. And so these are very useful layers to be able to appreciate and work on and be able to rely on having a certain capability. Some other benefits of using layers are localization of dependencies. If you go and make some bug fixes within a well-layered architecture, those bug fixes shouldn't percolate out and impede or affect anything else in your software if the layers are obeyed properly. Likewise, something else you can do is actually go in and change the implementations of the layer modules altogether. You can provide different algorithms, different services, plug and play without breaking what you've already got. One of the things we learned over the time developing host infrastructure middleware was that by providing a layer on top of the operating system, the operating system became exchangeable. We could run the same applications on top of Windows, different versions of Linux, different versions of Unix, VxWorks, and so on. So it gave us and our sponsors and collaborators a lot more freedom to make the right choices for the right reasons. There are, of course, some downsides to layering. One of the big issues is that if you're not careful and you don't think ahead of time about the dependencies across the layers, when you make some changes that are cross-cutting and cross-layering, 
you may end up with cascading changes being affected from top to bottom. For example, if you try to add things like certain kinds of memory management or certain kinds of security protocols or fault tolerance, that may actually percolate through the layers and be very expensive to have to add on later. Another classic complaint with layers is the high amount of overhead that they incur. Each layer may not incur much overhead, but if you have 12 layers or eight layers, each of which adds five to 10%, pretty soon you've got a rather slow solution. And uh, compared to a monolithic solution where you can optimize things with tighter couplings and tighter dependencies, very layered approaches may miss the opportunities to work across those layers. One of the other classic problems related to overhead is unnecessary work. You may end up allocating memory in too many different parts of the layers and copying data across layers. You may also end up doing things that would involve buffering or retransmitting or checksumming and so on in the layers, where you may actually only need to do that one place, but each layer doesn't quite know the context in which it exists. So you always have to be careful about this. And of course, another challenge with a layered approach is identifying what the correct granularity of the layers should be. If you have too many really small layers and you do foolish things like make each layer a process or thread, you can greatly slow your solution down. Conversely, if you have only a couple of layers, you may end up not solving the original problem we discussed, which is the complexity of combining lots of modules, lots of capabilities, without obeying any type of hierarchical decomposition. So to summarize this part of the module, today's concurrent and network software systems consist of capabilities provided by multiple layers of middleware, operating systems, protocols, and hardware. In this course, we are going to focus primarily on host infrastructure middleware and distribution middleware. Those are the areas where concurrent and network programming patterns and frameworks are going to make the biggest impact. And of course, our goal through a lot of this is to demonstrate how to use these layers of software to either build higher layers, like common middleware services or domain-specific middleware, or perhaps more likely build applications that can use these capabilities.